The events surrounding the University of Missouri football team over the past couple of weeks have been unprecedented on many levels in the history of college football. On many levels, nothing that we've seen since going back to the 1960s or early 70s. We bring in uh, Jack Hummel of uh, KOMU right there in uh, Columbia, Missouri, to help us sort through some of this stuff. And then beyond that, what's happened on the football field regarding uh, head coach Gary Pinkle. So, Jack, it's it's always a fun discussion, maybe not so much uh, early in this portion of our conversation. But thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Mark. I'm excited. So let's put the politics aside, uh, the social issues aside. Just being a student at the University of Missouri, some of the conversations you've had with other students, can you give us some kind of feel for what it's been like just to be on campus the past few weeks? Sure. You know, and just as a student, it's been, it's certainly been interesting. I think anyone can see that who's turned on the TV and seen, you know, the Missouri, you know, University of Missouri in the headline. Um, it's definitely been a very complicated situation, a situation where you're going to see a lot of different sides and a lot of different aspects, but um, there's a lot of aspects that people don't see. And as a student, you kind of get an interesting feel away from the, you know, the national broadcast and the national media. And that was just kind of just the different feelings and emotions that were kind of just running through campus the entire time. And, you know, there was a lot of fear at, at certain points, um, but a lot of things that you didn't see in the national headlines that I found to be really, really interesting were just, you know, class, you know, the students caring for students. Um, you, there were a lot of situations and a couple that um, I know made the media, but not, you know, as big as some of the other things. And that was teachers and different students um, opening up to have class away from campus so that students felt safe. Um, opening up their homes and saying, hey, we'll meet at my apartment. We can meet at, you know, teacher's house. Um, and if everyone's not comfortable doing that or you don't feel comfortable doing that, we'll send you notes or we'll take a integrity video, like an online class recording, and we'll send it to you and we'll get it to you, whatever you want to do to make you feel safe. And the amount of emails from different professors with the number one safety, number one concern being their students' safety, um, I think was just really incredible. And students just taking care of students, um, you know, the amount of calls I've received and that I've gave the students saying, um, hey, are you on campus? Do you need somewhere to come and just hang out, you know, in between class or sleep, spend the night? I, you know, I got an extra couch or, you know, you need to go grocery shopping. I'm running up to the store. Or, you know, you want to grab your food. And it's just that kind of thing that I think really kind of encompasses what Mizzou is. And that's just a family. And I know, um, you know, families sometimes disagree and families sometimes, sometimes have different viewpoints. But I think in the end, and, you know, it's kind of our, you know, hashtag of hashtag one Mizzou. I think we are one Mizzou. And I think um, we're certainly going to continue to work towards uh, making that more, um, more you know, correct in a situation of whether it's race, religion, anything. And I think um, that should be our number one concern is talking to each other um, and not at each other and not having different viewpoints, just coming together. And, and remember that we are still, you know, we're all Missouri Tigers here. And, um, you know, that's our number one concern. So it's, as a student, it was incredibly, incredibly interesting. Um, and then so, you know, walk into a news uh, studio um, and then go on the air and talk about it or cover it um, was certainly interesting and um, a great opportunity because you get a different perspective. You can talk to students and you kind of know where they're coming from. So I think um, in a sense, and to, for us to be able to break that story at KOMU, I think was um, really incredible, but also kind of beneficial because we do have that um, little bit of a help factored in being, you know, a student, you know, having a lot of students on air most of the time. So I think you know, it was extremely, extremely interesting. Well, considering well, all the bad that has reported, reported you know, I, I appreciate you sharing, sharing some, of some of that perspective, perspective about, about some of the good that's happened uh, because of that. And I'm a firm believer that uh, when when negative things happen, that there's an opportunity for good to come from it. And uh, certainly that's been the case there. And we see that time and time again where most people, some really good people, will step up and do some extraordinary things uh, faced with adversity. So that's not enough that a few days later that head coach Gary Pinkle announces that uh, due to non-Hodgkin lymphoma that was diagnosed back in May that he can't continue as the Missouri football coach. Uh, so that's generally, as I understand it, unrelated. Uh, Gary Pinkle, I think just in recent years, Jack, has, has been given some of the credit that's been due him for quite a long time when some people have considered, okay, move to the SEC, continue winning, winning at an even greater rate. It's been amazing, uh, Gary Pinkle. So before we look at the legacy, uh, just uh, how that story unfolded and some, some of the um, maybe some of the um, more uh, perspective that you have from, from being right there. You know, it was a, a I think, interesting situation, and this is, I think, for me, um, I don't think I've ever seen a college coach or program, for that matter, 
make a statement that Gary Pinkle and Mizzou have made um, and just coming together in a, as one in such a difficult time of, you know, just difficulty and separation around campus and just as a university as a whole. And so um, about 30 players, basically, as we know, decided they wanted to support the hunger strike that was going on uh, at the University of Missouri between graduate students at the start, um, which then kind of paralleled into um, also undergraduate um, and teachers uh, that we've heard of um, by not participating in football activities. So, um, you know, that was on Thursday, I think, and the next day, Friday, um, no one had really dis heard whether or not other players had, you know, joined in the support, whether, you know, what the coaching staff was going to be, whether those players would be um, kind of in trouble or suspended or what the situation was going to be. You know, not anything goes at this point, and we saw that through the past week that, you know, we can't expect anything um, at this point as far as, as assume anything. And so the next day, Gary Pinkle took to social media and announced that he was in complete and full support of his players. And for me, I think just watching that, and I was actually down in Clemson on my way back. I was in the North Carolina airport when I saw – the tweet and got a bunch of text messages saying, when are you getting home? Um, you know, and I think regardless of what side you're on or what side you take on the issue, you have to have great respect for a coach, Gary Pinkle, standing behind his players and really, you know, beyond anything, just bringing them together because regardless of whether a team has chemistry, or whether we want to go in, into that and judge that, you're bringing players together through an issue that's been so prevalent since, you know, it's always been there, you know, it's, it's history. And so I think to, to go beyond that and go beyond what those circumstances and what those consequences might be, whether that's financially or politically, I think really makes a true statement on a player, on a coach that has really kind of crafted his entire time here at Mizzou and his entire career around his players. And I, he's such a selfless individual. We'll get into that in a minute, like we said, but for him to do that, I think speaks so much volume about him as a, you know, his character and his, him as not only a coach, but a person and just his belief that he has in his players um, and the love he has for those guys. Um, and I mean, financially, you know, there were a lot of speculations on whether or not, um, you know, and then we found out that they were going to play and that the players would play after the resignation of the president um, as well as the chancellor. And so people kind of went in and said, well, do you think that that, you know, do you think the players kind of put it on the map? And sure, they put it on the map and they put, gave it a national attention, the national spotlight, because it is a Division One football program in the SEC. Sure, that's going to make headlines more than a group of students advocating the same thing. But I think you have to give credit just as much as you give credit to Gary Pinkle and the football team and all those players that kind of stepped up and said, this is where we're going to hold our ground. I think you have to support those students that were, you know, fighting for their right and what they wanted. And so I think, sure, you can give the football team credit, but those, you know, those group of students were the ones that put this on the map and that began this, you know, this kind of, um, kind of fight towards what they believe is civil justice and that in the end kind of turned out to what they wanted. Um, so people have speculated, sure, whether or not the game would be played, um, just solely because of financial reasons that we saw the numbers um, on how much it would, you know, the astronomical number of what it would cost. Um, aside from the money to BYU, you have ESPN um, who broadcasts the game. You have the officials, ticket holders. Um, and aside from that, you know, the, the game being played at Arrowhead has been something that's been occurring for years here at this Missouri football program, I mean, even before, uh, you know, joining the SEC. And so the thought that Arrowhead would never allow – these guys back again was another thought. And so whether or not, you know, we'll ever know um, whether the financial aspect really had a, um, you know, had a role in that or whether that would have affected the decision made, you know, they'll never tell us and we'll never really find out. But, um, you know, that's another interesting aspect, I think. But again, all hats off to Gary Pinkle and his, his coaching staff and his players um, for just really kind of rallying around a group of students and, and their belief and standing up for what they thought was right. And I think, like I said, regardless of what side you take, it's, it's pretty remarkable, but it was it was very very great to cover, and I was blessed to be able to cover it. Yeah, as you, as you allude to, Jack, uh, there's that social media aspect of all the criticism and all the the, the taking of sides that people do uh, in in criticism or in support of Gary Pinkle. Um, I, I wrestle back and forth with it, but that's easy to do from miles away. Uh, I, I think the bottom line is that regardless of the stance that any particular person would take or him as an individual. Uh, would, would take concerning the issue. He he owned up to the responsibility that he has to those players and the obligations and, and the and the family. You mentioned family, and um, outside of a bloodline, that's about as close a, a knit family as there is when you talk uh, athletics uh, within that football locker room. And he took ownership and responsibility uh, of and and standing by 
somewhat of an oath or a contract that he has with those players and with their families that when they go to play football at that football program, that he's going to be somewhat of a father and a caretaker for those players. And that's, that's what he did um, to the nth degree. So um, kudos to Gary Pinkle uh, looking at the coaching side. Wow. On one hand, you have the numbers and the division championships and all the things that can be quantified. Then you have to put that in perspective in regards to the competition he's had to face uh, over the years at Missouri and how he's been able to withstand maybe more talented opposition. And then you put in perspective uh, just a few minutes ago, what can't be um, tangibly quantified in regards to the kind of man he is and leader of young men. So just your thoughts about Gary Pinkle's legacy as he leaves Mizzou. I mean, I've said it and I, I, t- I kind of took to Twitter after just because for me, it, it really hit home. Uh, Coach Pinkle was one of the first guys um, when I came down to Columbia, I was uh, lucky enough to interview kind of off of a whim, kind of totally out of the dark. Wow. I'm actually going to get to interview Gary Pinkle. This is out of nowhere. I'm um, just through knowing some players and them kind of saying, Hey, this, you know, this kid's got an opportunity. Let's, let's give him, let's see what, and hook him up with and you know I was able to interview him and um you know he's just such like I said he's such a selfless you know we found out from Friday he was running like you said um due to you know non-Hoskins lymphoma you know a lot of people before that that you know they kind of read further in the byline of that that um you know that it was due to his cancer um people obviously kind of thought who could this have anything to do with um you know, all, everything that was going on around campus and politically and, you know, the taking behind the team and everything. Um, and, you know, to go kind of further into that before we go into just his legacy, which you could talk about for hours, um, you know, sitting through the press conferences this past week with Coach Pinkle, he made the decision in May after visiting um, with his family, but also he also wanted to just keep coaching as long as he possibly could. Um, he'd been receiving treatments in the Mayo Clinic um, in May and June um, away from Columbia um, just in order to keep the word of his illness quiet. And, you know, I found this, you know, again, to be extremely, extremely interesting, like just being selfless. And the one reason they said that they, you know, Mayo Clinic, obviously it's, you know, remarkable, you know, clinic to go have treatment, especially cancer. And, um, you know, people were kind of, you know, turn their head and say, um, okay, well then is it that bad? And he's continually, he's continually said, um, you know, I'm fine. Uh, it's okay right now. I'm feeling fine. I'm doing well. Um, but he, the reason he went to the Mayo Clinic, aside from just the you know medically medical treatment um, and how, how high ranked it is, was that he was afraid that it would hurt recruiting it and the focus of his current players if they found out he had cancer. Now, for someone who has an illness that, in the end, most likely could kill you and that will and you just have for the rest of your life, to have your main focus during that time be your current players and the recruiting class and the future of the football program that you coach on Saturdays. I thought it was remarkable. I mean, it's it's like something I've never seen. Like I, we keep talking about, it's going to be a movie. I mean, there's no doubt. Um, and you know, he knew that he would reassess um, those things at some point, and then during the bye week, um, decided that it would be best for him to step down. And then whether or not he would announce that, he said he would wait most likely until after the season or towards the end of the season, maybe after the bowl game. Um, and then during just I think it was a Friday um, when he announced it, he went in and met with his players because apparently it had been leaked whether that was from the Mayo Clinic um, or what it was. And he said he couldn't let his players find out through a tweet, through an article, through any type of, you know, article, anything. He said he had to be the ones that told his players. And so I think from what it sounded like, it very, very, very much caught him off guard. Um, and it wasn't the way he wanted to do it. And it was in a very emotional meeting um, with his coaching staff first and then obviously his players. Um, and so I think, like I said, just that story alone, um, it just breaks your heart because he, he's such a great coach and such a great man. Um, and, but he made it again. He made it very clear um, that he isn't doing poorly. That the lymphoma lymphoma is manageable, um, but there is no cure. And so he wants to focus on life outside of football. Um, and you know, spending with the time, spending the time he has left with his family. And so I think um, in the way that he's gone about this entire thing, I think has been outstandingly, you know, and correct, outstanding and correct. Um, and I just, you know, you, your heart goes out to him. Um, during this time, and obviously just an immense amount of prayers um, headed GP's way right now. Uh, but going into just um, just the legendary history and, and record of Coach Pinkle and just how he's brought this program from nowhere, he's the winningest football coach um, in school history. I believe it's like 116 or 17 to 73 or 74. Um, 
and you know a record over 15 season he's also the winningest coach in toledo um, which they actually had the opportunity to go back last season and play them kind of an out of schedule game and so i think um which is very very interesting and i think it's awesome but you know you take a team from the big 12 to the sec just without a doubt one of the best conferences in college football and was when mizzou joined it's interesting because when mizzou joined the sec in 2012 the tigers went five and seven so a lot of people speculated whether or not even this school belonged there, but much less is that is this co if this coach was capable of leading this team in the best conference in college football, and you know if they continued to struggle, could his job be on the line? And so I don't know whether or not he took that to heart or whether it was just you know kind of a transition year. I think the latter of the two, but they went and won back-to-back -back SEC's titles, and so I think you can't you know it it the list goes on and on and on. You have five ten-win seasons, a division title five in the last eight seasons. You know, and the last time Missouri had a 10-win season was, you know, before Pinkle was in 1960. So it's not like it was in the later 90s or, you know, right before, you know, GP came. And it's remarkable. Ten bowl appearances, six bowl wins, you know, six for full and four in bowl games. It's unbelievable. And so I think um, we've seen where this Missouri Tigers team football was when Gary Pinkle took it over. And you see where it has been just the past three seasons. And you can even count in this season, I think. And that's even a testament to – how incredibly powerful this team has been the past, you know, half decade. And so I think, you know, the thing that I thought was most interesting was most coaches that take over a program, just like whoever, you know, will take over this program, you know, go in with its foundation somewhat built and somewhat kind of established. Gary Pinkle came in with a hammer and a nail and made it what it is today without a doubt, created his own coaching staff, built his own coaching staff up, found specialists in different areas. I mean, he's brought it to where it is today. He took this program, from the shadows of the valley to the heights of its of it, you know of its program's history, and so I think, you know, you could go on and on and on and talk about records and wins and losses, but I think, you know, if you step back, the thing that's even more impressive than the wins, the records, the numbers, um, is just the outpour of support. Even this past week, from past players and current players of Gary Pinkle, and I think, you know, whether it was the Twitter, whether you know the tweets, whether it was the interviews, the posts, the pictures, I um, mean, it's heart wrenching as you see how much of an impact this man had on so many different players from so many different years over the course of his time here. And it's incredible. Um, and you forget football. I mean, like I said, he's such a selfless guy and Gary Pinkle cares about his players more than a Jersey number. And that sounds so cliche, but he cares about, about them as people. And you can see that you especially saw this week. And I think anyone who had any doubt of whether or not it was a facade or whether or not this was just an act to try to surpass the media and bring in more recruits. And it's a recruiting scheme. The way that he spoke at the press conference post, um, announcement and post the win over BYU on Tuesday, um, kind of a celebratory um, press conference. The way that he went through that entire press conference, and as soon as he started talking about his players, broke down and was uncontrollably crying. And I think just it's, it's such an honest and real um, feelings and, and emotion that there's no doubt that this man, this is a guy who goes out there on Saturdays and every day beforehand and is only there for his players, not himself. And it's just a really, really incredible story, but it's an incredible story about Gary Pinkle and just the relationship with his players. And we're going to miss him. I mean, it's, I'm going to miss covering him. I know guys are obviously going to miss playing for him um, that have even closer relationships than anyone else. But um, you know, it's really incredible. And it, what we're going to be sad to see him going. It's certainly, certainly big shoes to fill. Yeah. And so for a guy who built the program, as you so eloquently described, and then wins all these games, transitions to the SEC, continues to win, and then – with all the personal issues that he has to face uh, from a health perspective, has to deal with the situation that he does, takes a stand, and then his team goes out and plays for him like they did against a very good BYU team and, and wins a fifth game of the season. Uh, it, it's all very incredible. And you mentioned movie-like, and, and I would not be surprised to see somebody uh, grab hold of this story. There's no question about that. So nobody's going to replace Gary Pinkle. Somebody has to take over as Missouri head coach. Uh, what names are you hearing, Jack? There's a lot of speculation going on right now. Um, I mean, I think from what I've heard, and they had a press conference yesterday where there weren't really any names that were thrown out. Of course, there's speculation, and Feinbaum has uh, made his list, and there's been a couple other people that have kind of come out with their list. And um, from what it sounded like, I mean, it's a very, very open position. I think you're going to see a lot of um, very, very talented people that um, could be applying for this role and could be suggested for this role. Um, but I think. Um, it's going to be, it has to be someone, and even Gary Pinkle has gone in to say that, um, you know, it's going to be somebody that 
is going to make it their own, just like Gary Pinkle did, but that isn't afraid to change things and isn't afraid to kind of go out on a limb and take a risk with this team, just like Gary Pinkle has done over the past 15 seasons. And so I think you could throw out a lot of different names, but um, it's tough to say who. Um, I think Odom could be, um, I think, top of the list right now. I think if I had to pick one, that would be who. But obviously there's so many different people that have even came on the last two days now that it's kind of getting closer to um, kind of that two-week period that they suggested um, of, you know, who could take over. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, I'm kind of looking to see the cards kind of just play out and see what uh, who steps in. And I think whoever whoever will, will be, um, and Gary Pinkle, you know, said it best, that he, tr- he has complete trust in um, the athletic director, Mark Rhodes, um, and their entire staff as far as their um, choosing of who will who will replace Gary Pinkle um, or do their best job of doing that. Um, and so I think it's it'll be interesting um, for sure, um, but uh, we'll we'll see. I think um, whoever it is is going to have some big shoes to fill. But I think it'll be, um, especially coming off of this season, it's going to be a you know a rebuilding year. That I think the the program or the staff there now has kind of established um, at least um, their core for next year um, and continued improvement. Um, and so I think it's going to be interesting to kind of see um, who's going to come over um, and take over this Missouri football program. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Barry Odom, defensive coordinator, who's been with Pinkle for a long time, uh, a left to, to join the Memphis staff for a little while, but uh, has been with Pinkle and has a history with uh, the head coach for quite some time. Yeah, a lot of names uh, involving maybe group of five teams that uh, are on solid ground with guys like Tom Herman from Houston, Matt Rule from Temple, a lot of candidates out there and a lot of head coaching jobs that are very um, – very prominent jobs that uh, need to be filled talking USC, Miami, Virginia Tech, and South Carolina. Two games left to play, Jack. Uh, the team's five and five, one and five in the SEC. If we would have been talking about adversity for this football team a couple months ago, you know, this pales in comparison. But at that point, it would have been Matty Mock hurt, then suspended indefinitely. The leader of this football team for the past few years has taken much criticism for his play on the field, some of his decisions. But bottom line, the kid was 21-5 and five as the starting quarterback at Mizzou. Drew Locke takes over. So that was the adversity at that point, and now it's been completely dwarfed. Just your thought of, of, about where the, the talent stands, Drew Locke's play, Russell Hansbrough obviously will be moving on uh, as the, the main playmaker on this team. But you got some guys like uh, – Ish Witter and uh, Nate Brown, who have made some plays this year as uh, underclassmen. Uh, so Mizzou football for 2016. You know, I think, um, like I said before, this is a complete rebuilding year um, for the Missouri Tigers, and I don't think it started out as one. Um, but we saw that kind of, and it happens all the time, the talent that we kind of assume not is there, but that we can count on and rely on wholeheartedly to lead an SEC program sometimes isn't there. Um, and I think this was one of those years where they, not that the talent wasn't there, but I think the kind of putting it together and putting on the show, we have all the stage acts, but putting that together is certainly a different thing and a different story. And so uh, I think this was a complete rebuilding year. I think um, when you look at this Missouri football program, um, they have an immense amount of talent. Drew Locke to start, um, you know, the kid's hardly 18. I mean, um, you see his face and he looks like, um, you know, he's still a high schooler, which in most of the cases, these guys still are. They're 18 years old and you're asking them to go out there and do what, you know, a 21 year old, 22 year old normally would do, especially in this division. And I think, um, you know, you look at that and I think you can't help, but, you know, give him credit and, uh, kind of give him the benefit of the doubt that he, the kid is young. This is his first year. And I think a lot of people expected more from him, um, because of, um, his high school ran the exact same offense. Uh, the Gary Pinkle and Mizzou run. And so I think a lot of people said, oh, he can handle it then. There's not even a comparison to high school football to college football. And um, not to say that he can. I mean, we've seen him go out there, and I think I have complete belief in him, um, especially after the first couple of games. I was a little bit skeptical, um, you know, as Ma kind of came out and he came in, um, just to see how he would do solely because he is so young. Um, but I think I was extremely impressed over the past, you know, three or four weeks at his play, even though – you know, the scoreboard doesn't show it as an 18 year old, that kid's going out there and doing what most people couldn't even as sophomores or juniors. And so you see a lot of talent um, in him. You said um, Russell Hansborough, who's obviously going to be moving on. That's, you know, obviously a role to fill um, that has really helped the offense, even just in the past two weeks. Um, and so I think that's going to be obviously a position that we look for. 
wide receivers, I think that's from what I've heard um, just around coaching staff and around everything, that's going to be certainly an off-season kind of added to the to-do list is kind of just not replace them but work with them. Um, continued improvement, continued off-season improvement this spring, um, and just to kind of continue to work. And I think that's that should be the the motto for, I think, this off-season and spring ball um, for this football program. It should, should be the off-season. Take advantage of the off-season. You had a rough year. Um, it's time to kind of bunker down um, and get after it and continue to improve, continue to work on the things that we know we need to focus on, continue to work on the things we're good at, you know, defense, continue to improve it, lock the defense up. We have one of the best defenses, in my opinion, in the East this year. And I think a lot of times that went unnoticed because we were scoring, you know, anywhere from three to six points a game as a football player, not a soccer team, you know? And I think, so you look at that and I think a lot of times, just like anything, it takes the pressure, not pressure, but it takes the attention and it takes the spotlight off of, you know, whether it's an offense or defense and throws it on, you know, kind of the negativity, which can circulate throughout a whole team. You put that negative, you know, kind of air in there and it spreads throughout the whole team. And I think then the off, the defense starts to struggle. But I think in that BYU game, especially, um, obviously they had a little bit of uh, fire underneath their belts um, after Friday's announcement the day before, which a lot of people speculated whether they'd even be able to play that game you know, in their right mind. And I think they went out and played outstanding. But I think um, this offseason has to be a season to continue to rebuild. Um, anytime you have a quote-unquote rebuilding year, if you can even call it that, um, you know, you have to continue. Offseason is where you rebuild. And so I think that's where this football program needs to take advantage. But I'm not concerned about 2016. I think this team and whoever takes over as coach, I think with Gary Pinkle still there and the improvements they've even made from, call it, you know, our second or third game until now, I think is remarkable too, even though, you know, the record may not show that so evidently. I think it's a program that still has potential, I think, still has the opportunity to go and, you know, get after the East and hopefully, you know, make their mark on another season like we had the past two seasons before now. Jack Hummel joining us from KOMU. Jack, uh, when all this started to go down, I knew you were running around like a crazy man. So I'm, I'm glad I was able to catch up with you because I, I, I know of no one else who was able to provide uh, the kind of insight into the situation surrounding uh, the events on campus and also the Missouri football program in light of everything that's happened over the last few weeks. So. Appreciate you joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.